Welcome. In this video, I want to present to you a lecture that I gave on abstract members, abstract classes, and interfaces. Now, this is a continuation of a lecture on polymorphism. I taught a course in object-oriented programming in C++. I've been uploading, I've been uploading some of those uh, lectures here on YouTube. So what I strongly suggest is for you to go check out the videos on inheritance, which then is followed by polymorphism, and then this one. If you feel like you have a very solid knowledge on inheritance and you understand the concept of polymorphism, then you are welcome to skip it and just stay here and watch this, this video on interfaces and abstract members. However, I strongly recommend that you check them out because it's a continuation. I use the same code examples, the same uh, examples that I use to explain these concepts. So I think you would get a much more complete of the whole thing. However, if not, then just feel free to stay here. All right. So hope you enjoy the lecture, but most importantly, I hope you learn something new. Today, we're actually continuing polymorphism because we're talking about abstract members and abstract members. Uh, it's a thing that, com that connects directly to polymorphism. So let me just make this full screen. All right. So we learn again about inheritance, right? So we have an animal class with some members and then all these other classes they, they inherit from the class and then they uh, add functionality or other members whatever members it could either be data characteristics like these two or it could be functionality like these other eight and then of course we learn about polymorphism which we said okay well if the dog inherits from animal all these members but the dog would like to be more specific as to what this function does then i can simply in my in my parent class make that function virtual and and by making the virtual function in our base class like our animal class then the other derived classes like dog and cat they can come and then override it right so we make them virtual which basically means basically means uh this is my eat function but my children will modify it or can modify it they, they, they don't have to modify it and of course in the dog class all we do is we we redeclare and we redefine the eat function but we marked it as an override. So now we're saying my my parents function eat will be overridden by this new eat function, right? So we talked about function overrides. And this means do not use my parents eat function, use mine instead. Now, a base class defines a generic version of the derived class, right? So when we were when we were talking about use cases for inheritance, we sort of said, okay, well a base class defines a generic version of the derived class and part of this definition is what the generic functions do like for example our eating function in animal right that's part of the description of the animal class right of our generic class so in here our generic class is animal which has now you could think of a generic eating function right well here's an exercise uh so here's an exercise so i'm going to ask you a question and i just want you to just to, to use your imagination okay that's all i want you to do i just want you to use your imagination i want you to think of an animal eating but do not think of a specific animal think of a generic animal what comes to your mind just some generic animal but not a specific animal right don't think of a dog don't think of a cat or an elephant just think of a generic animal eating what do you think what comes to your to your mind teeth okay <laughs> someone said me eating okay well but you're specific right you're specific so, so all right so 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 a lot of the a lot of the comments is chewing mouth chewing someone says my dog okay the problem with uh with with my dog is that that's a specific right so a dog a dog is specific my dog is even more specific because you're, you're thinking of a even more specific thing right so what, what once you realize is most of you said okay well there's there's some form of chewing right okay well that's kind of the, the the concept of eating you know you got food going in your mouth and then you have to process it so you chew it to make it easier on your stomach to digest it or so that you can even swallow it if you if you're eating like meat or something. So so but what I want you to think is that it's a little complicated to think of a generic yeah, chewing food. So it's a little complicated to think of a generic animal eating, right? Cuz you're like, well, I don't know what a generic animal looks like, right? If I just, you know, and I think I have it on the next slide, right? So we have an animal, 
how does a generic animal eat, right? So you guys say, well, I can't really picture an entire animal eating, but I can picture something just chewing, right? Just some kind of chewing. Now, let me make it even more worse. How does a generic animal even look without being specific? So don't describe a dog. Don't describe a cat or a elephant or a fish. Just how does a animal look, a generic animal? If you try to, well, not not all uh, animals have legs, right? Fish don't have legs. I mean, you guys, you guys yelled at me in the beginning of the course because I said that that mammals walk, and then you guys brought up the whale, all right? And then not animals have hair. Fish don't have hair, right? So just think of uh, uh, all, right? <laughs> so just think of all the animals, all the animals out there, every animal that exists. Right. Just how does it how, if you had a, a, a child who has never seen any animal at all and you and you and they say, what is an animal? And, and you try to describe it, you would have to use specific things. You would even say, well, some animals have this. Some animals have that. Right. And then you would try to explain, like, you know, maybe the most common ones. But the point here is that some of these things, we know them, we use them, but we don't even think about them. Right? We know what an animal is, I, I, well, at least we, we, we think now, maybe we don't anymore, but we, we know what kind of what an animal is. And, and the thing about this is that we don't necessarily know how to describe it without actually being specific. We describe the, the generic idea of an animal, but we can't describe it without actually going into the specifics. And so, as you can imagine, that's, that's, that can be problematic because when we, when we wrote our code, let me go back to our animal class. When we wrote our, our code, come on, come on, Visual Studio. Okay. When we wrote our code, you know, we have an eating function, right? Here, the animal is eating that amount of pounds, right? And then we said, well, this is how a generic animal eats. However, we might not be happy with that description of how an animal eats when we talk about a dog. So then we said, well, we, let's make this eating function a virtual function and then we override it in the dog uh, class, right? So the dog class now says, you know, it, it's eating that many amount of food and it's eating it like a dog now, right? So now this is very basic. I'm just using the terminal to describe like, like objects doing things. However, uh, imagine if you're doing a simulation. If you're doing a simulation, right? You, you, have a bunch, you have a 3D model eating, right? Like they're eating food, like maybe think of a video game or something like that. What would happen is that when you look at this, how, how would you code a generic animal eating? How would you code the 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 animation of a, a generic animal eating? Well, you don't even know what a generic animal looks like. How is it going to be part of your simulation? How are you going to make it eat if you don't even know how a generic animal eats, right? So there's a problem is that I have that given a description to this eating function, but we sort of say that if this was to be a real life simulation, we wouldn't know exactly what to put here. We're like, okay, how would I do that animation, right? And we're not going into graphics. That's a whole other realm. But the point is that you would have some code that, that does the, the graphical stuff. And you would say, well, the animal is eating. What does that mean, right? That would be problematic. So, okay, so it says, it's a lot easier to tell you what an animal isn't. Like it isn't an insect because it has, or that, but trying to just describe it is difficult. Yeah, you could you can um, certainly, uh, describe what it is in, but that would be assuming that you know that what the other things are, right? So like you gave an example, I would say, well, you would know what an insect is, but if I don't know what an insect is, then it doesn't help, right? So, so yeah, uh, but, but I got you. It, really, a, a lot of things in life, it's, it's all about uh, contrast. It's all about the difference between one thing and another, right? If something doesn't have, if you cannot differentiate two things, then you can really you can't really describe them separately. You know, they're like, oh, they're, they're the same. So they, there has to be something that it's different. Non-human, non-alien. Yeah, there you go. I mean, we can keep on going and try to give descriptions. But okay, so my point here is that sometimes we understand that there is, there's an idea. In this case, it's animal. And that idea has certain things. But we cannot really describe them without being specific, okay? That that's 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 the the theme of today's lecture. All right, uh, uh, the base idea knows some things, 
but we can't really describe them exactly. Okay, so one of the reasons we use inheritance is to provide with a generic description of an object, like an animal to a dog. What happens when we know there is something, but we don't know how exactly it works, right? Like the eating function. We know animals eat. However, we don't know exactly how they eat in general, right? So that, that's the last bullet. We don't know how an idea of an animal eating looks like. So now we are trying to apply this same idea, the same fact about, I don't know how the specificness of this generic object is going to behave, but I know that it must have this. So then we go to something called abstract functions, right? So an abstract function has no body. So it has no, and okay, so a function, because I, I sometimes, you know, let, let's just put it again out there. A function has three things. It has a return type, it has a signature, and a body, right? The signature has two things. It has the function name and the, and the parameters, right? The body is the curly braces, is what you put inside the curly braces, right? It's like, it's the thing that the function does. It's what it's used for, right? So what I'm saying is that an abstract function doesn't have a body, right? And the way we create an abstract function inside of a class is we say, the, we put the virtual keyword in the front and we set the function equal to zero. So we do these two things. I set it virtual and I set it equal to zero, right? And this is the same thing as, it looks very similar to virtual functions, right? A virtual function looks just like this. The only difference is that it's not equal to zero. Instead, it has a body. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. We'll talk about interfaces at the end of the, this, it's part of this lecture. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So, so an abstract function uh, um, is basically the same thing as a virtual function. The only difference is that virtual functions do have a body. Abstract functions do not have a body. And the way you tell C++ this function does not have a body, therefore it is abstract, we set the function equal to zero, right? That's the notation that it was chosen. Why zero? Why not? That's what they said. You know, zero means nothing. So this says, hey, this is equals to nothing, right? And we mark it virtual. We're saying, hey, our derived class can overwrite this function and implement it. But we, because we don't know, the animal class doesn't know how this eating function works. I'm just going to set it equal to zero, meaning the functionality is there, but I don't know how that functionality works. Okay. So you're just kind of like saying, you know, there is the concept of eating, but I don't know how it works, right? So we set it equal to zero and we mark it as virtual. This is called an abstract function, or sometimes it's called a pure virtual function, right? Pure virtual because it's pure virtual. It has no body, right? And and, and it would be more clear why we call it a pure function in the, in the next slide. But, but basically what this is saying, if you want to say it out loud, is the animal class is saying, I don't know how eat works, but my children will tell you, okay? This is what it means. My children will tell you how it works. Now, a derived class must, okay, it's, this is a must. It's not optional. It's not if you're feeling like doing it. No, a derived class must override and implement the abstract function, right? So here is dog who inherits from animal. And then now dog has the eat function. Which one? This one, the one we said as virtual previously. And then we override it, right? So base, these three arrows tells you the new things. Over here, in, in, the, in the base class, we mark it as virtual, set it equal to zero. In the derived class, we override it and we give it a body, right? So we, we give like open and close curly braces. And what this is saying, it says, hey, uh, I'm telling you what this eat function does, just how my parent told you that I was going to tell you how it works, right? So basically, it's the same thing as virtual functions, except the only difference is that the base class is forcing the children to override it, right? Before, if we wanted to override it, you could. If you didn't want to override it, you didn't have to. And, and here, if we can look at it again. Uh, dog, let me look at dog. Dog, the dog class, right? It override the eating function, right? Because the, the, the eating function was virtual in, in uh, the animal class. But if we look at cat, cat, we didn't override it, right? So, so, so here cat says, nah, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not specifying how I eat. I'm gonna eat like a generic animal. That's, that's fine by me. 
right? So, so when, when it's something that's just virtual, we have the option to override it or not. When it's abstract, we have to. There is no mm, option. You have to, right? And if you do not override an abstract function, your code will not compile. It just won't compile, right? So let's just uh, let's just do it. Let's just show you, right? So before, so here we have a virtual function, right? Now I'm going to make it abstract. Making it abstract again, programmatically speaking, we don't do a lot of differences. It's just something very little. If I want to go from virtual function to abstract, I set it equal to zero, and that's it. So now this is a this is a virtual function, right? This is a virtual function, and now of course I don't. I'm not supposed to have a body. So where's my eating? I have to delete these, right? Well, I'm not going to delete it. I'm going to comment it out so that in case we want to put it back in the future, right? So so now these function no longer exists and it's not supposed to exist because it's saying, hey, I don't know how the function works, right? It, it, the functionality is there, but I don't know how it works. Now our dog has to override it. Fortunately, we already override it, right? So we don't have to do it again. However, we have a problem. Our parents eating function is, is pointless, right? It has no it has no logic, it has no body. So this no longer is, it, this is of no use. And in fact, I don't think this will actually uh, execute. I think this will give me an error. So basically the eating function for my parent does nothing. It's abstract. It doesn't have any logic, it contains no body. So I can no longer use my parent's eating function. I, I am providing the eating function now, right? So now I can add some logic here, you know, so let's just say eating, oops, eating, let's say amount, and then we go ah, pounds of food, like a dog, let's just say like a dog, right? Again, this is, we're just using terminal to, to, to display logic, but all of these things, you know, they, they could be a variety of code. You can put whatever you want here. If it's a simulation, you would have a animation code and a bunch of other things, right? So now, my dog has the eating function and it says, hey, I'm eating this many pounds uh, like a dog. Now, what I want you to realize is that in our, the, the animal class has no body, this one. Right, it has no body because I set it equal to zero and in my, in my CPP file, I delete it. I, I commented out, right? I commented out so I wouldn't delete the code but it's basically gone, right? right. It's, 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 I'll, 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 I'll just throw this at the bottom so we don't see it. But basically, practically speaking, it got deleted, right? So we don't have an eat function in, in animal class anymore. But the animal class does say there should be an eat function in my children. And dog is a child of animal, so dog must provide an eat function and override it, right? So we override it. Here we go override the eat function from my parent, my, my animal class parent. So now eat, uh, it's provided. Now what I wanna show you is that if we go to cat, uh, sometimes sometimes you would see the error here, I guess not, but right now I'm gonna build it and you would see that we're gonna get an error. Okay, we didn't get an error, but we should have gotten an error. Let's see, maybe because I'm not, okay. Yeah, okay, I, I know why we're not getting an error. All right, so basically, this cat, this class has to implement this function, right? Otherwise, it cannot be used. And so to show you that, let's just go here and let's just make a new, let's make this into a cat now, right? And the cat took a age and a pounds, right? And notice that it's saying, hey man, I cannot use it. And it says, hey, it's not allowed because the eating function has no overrider, right? So it's telling you, hey, it doesn't, it doesn't tell me what the function that the parent said the child was going to tell me it was supposed to do. Oh, that sounds like a mouthful. But basically, it didn't override the eating function from the parent. Therefore, I don't know how I can properly create a cat, right? Because the animal class is saying, hey, my child will tell you what eating means. And the child doesn't have that. So when you try to use it, it says, hey, your class is incomplete. There is a thing that's supposed to be provided to me but it's not provided. And because it's not provided, I cannot create an object out of that, right? Say it's a, think of it like a blueprint that is incomplete, right? It's like, it's missing a wall and you're like, how am I gonna build this? Uh, but basically uh, what's going on here is that we cannot create a, a instance 
of, of, and we'll talk about that in a second, but this is giving me the error saying, you need to provide the eating function in cat. Otherwise, I don't know how to construct cat. So now we can just come here and say, all right, well, let's just do it. Uh, let's just say avoid eat, and it takes a double amount, and we overwrite it, right? And then we have to go implement it. So I'm just going to get Visual Studio uh, um, to auto generate the code, and then I'll just copy paste my dog code. Uh, where's my dog? Where? Oh, okay, let me copy this because you know copy pasting is easier. And then we just change this to a cat, right? So now when I go back to my main CPP, now it says, okay, there you go, right? And if I run this, you will get, you know, eating five pounds of food like a cat. And then if I go and I change this to a dog, right? And of course the dog doesn't take those parameters, but let's just run it. Now the dog eating five pounds of food like a dog, right? So this is part of the polymorphic abilities, right? Polymorphic is this animal, this animal was a dog and the eating function was called and it ate like a dog. And then the same animal who then became a cat ate and it ate like a cat, right? And look how much code did we have to change? Almost absolutely nothing. We just constructed a different type of object. So that's the, 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 the beauty and power of polymorphism and, and what abstract functions uh, do and gives us, it just basically forces the derived classes to provide with certain functionalities. It just, it's a force. It's like, like saying, my child will tell you this, or will do this. Otherwise, they're not my child, right? Sounds harsh, but that's kind of how it works. All right, so abstract functions are cool because you force the derived classes to have and implement certain functionalities, like we did with the eating function, right? If cat doesn't provide an eating function, then it's not a child of me, it's an incomplete class, you cannot make objects out of it until it tells you how the eating function works. So, okay, so abstract functions are cool. They basically uh, are a way for the base class to force the derived classes to provide certain functionalities. Our dog animal example, the animal class forces all, all, forces all animals to have an eating function. So, so the animal idea doesn't know how an animal should eat, but it sure does ensure all animals better eat, right? And we had that exercise in the beginning. We don't know how animals eat in general, but certainly we know they eat. So the animal idea is causing derived classes to eat. Well, not really. It, it eats like a cat because we, we provide the function, right? We, we specify the function however we want it to specify it. Eating of food like a cat. This is not a generic animal anymore. So the generic animal says there is an eating functionality. The cat class says I inherit the members from my parent. And my parent says that I should provide you with the details of how the eating function works. So then the, the, the child, which is in this case the cat, he provides you with the details of how a cat should eat. So it's not how a, a generic cat eats. It's Sorry, it's not how a generic animal eats. It's eating like a cat, and it's provided in the cat class. So you you are basically... It's all it is, man. Like, don't, 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 don't. It's just forcing children to provide the body of the function. That's it. it, it the rest, uh, it's how we've been talking about virtual functions. All right. Okay. So here, here's a problem, though. Here's a problem. You know that that's what we do. We come up with problems and 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 stuff. So we add new features, and those new features problems emerge, and then we have to deal with them. So. We were able to create a dog, right? So we said dog, my dog, new dog. And then we were also able to create an animal, right? So we could create, I know for us as humans, we've, and based on the exercise that we did earlier, it's hard to think of a generic animal. But because we have provided characteristics of a generic animal, we were able to create a, a generic animal in our code. That's fine. So we could create a generic animal. So here's an uh, animal pointer called my animal, and we put a new animal in it. The problem is, well, do you see the problem? Before I bring it up, you see the problem in this. Now that we, we, before we introduced abstract functions, there was no issues. I just introduced an abstract function to the animal class. There is a problem. What is that problem? Basically, the animal class has a abstract function, which means that that function has no body which means if you try to use it, what, what is C++ supposed to do? 
or what is you know any programming language that you're using if your if your class has an abstract function and you create an instance of that class how would it be able to call that function right you might say well it shouldn't well it shouldn't but it's a function so the the option is there so if you try to call the eat function in a generic animal this is problematic because we don't know what that is supposed to do it's abstract right so 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 basically here the eating function that this animal instance is is using it it fails you cannot do it and c++ knows this c++ says if you have an abstract function you cannot use those abstract functions which means that you are an incomplete class right an animal as i mentioned earlier if you try to describe an animal without being specific what would happen is that you will have an incomplete idea right it's it's an incomplete idea you you have a, a good idea of it but it's incomplete because you don't know what an animal eating looks like you don't know what a generic animal uh, looks like so so the problem is that a class that has at least one abstract function at least one like our animal class has one abstract function that's the eating function we call that an abstract class okay so if the class has at least one abstract function we call it an abstract class and what on top of that we cannot create objects of abstract classes the moment that a class becomes abstract it becomes impossible for us to create instances of that class so this thing that we have right here it's a no no more we lose it right let's just show it real quick so in our animal right we, we make this into a a an abstract function if i go to my main tbp and i just try to create animal this will say hey uh, this is not allowed because the class type animal is abstract. It's abstract. And, and this is because the eating function is a pure virtual function. It's an abstract function, right? So we cannot create instances of classes that are abstract. And an abstract class is a class that has at least one abstract function. That's all you need. One abstract function and you destroy the ability to create instances of the class. But if you have an abstract function, that's okay, right? How, why would you be, if we don't know what an animal looks like, a generic one, why would you want to create one in the first place, right? Makes no sense. You wouldn't want to create one. You don't even know how one looks like. So it's all right. You, you, you make it such that this thing cannot be instantiated because it doesn't make sense. You just say, no, I don't make sense, but my children will make sense. So you can create instances of them and then they will be not abstract. They will be completely, you know, fill and, and, and fulfill and complete. And then you can create instances of that. So the moment that a function in a class is marked as abstract, meaning equal to zero with virtual in front of it, the class becomes abstract. And that moment, you can no longer create instances of that class. So we either have to do a dog or a cat, but not an animal. Now, yes, the dog is still an animal, right? The dog does have this abstract class as part of it. However, the dog is complete. It provides uh, details about what used to be abstract. So that's that's the only problem that we get with abstract functions. However, as I, as I showed you a second ago, we can still use variables of that base type, right? Uh, and then we just set it to to a, mod, a derived type. So we still keep the power of polymorphism. We don't lose uh, the data type. We just cannot create instances of it, right? But we can still use the data type to hold instances of its derived instances. So this is okay. Now C++ is smart when you treat, and this, we set this in the virtual functions. This is, this is basically a repeat of that. When you treat a derived instance as a base instance and call the abstract function, it will use the derived function, right? So here, the dog is put in an animal variable, right? So the dog pointer is put in an animal pointer. And when you call eat, it knows that this eating function is talking about the dog, right? Just to show you real fast, this animal is a dog, right? Why? Because we put a dog in it. So when I call eat, we're better to get that it's eating like a dog. Where's my code? Okay, eating five pounds like a dog, right? Now, if I go and I change this to a cat, cat, 
and the cat needs to age and a, and a weight, right? So here we have a 10 pound cat of or a one year old. And so now this is just using the same code, right? It's still treating the cat like an animal. And then I eat, this will call the cat eating function, eating like a cat. So C++ is smart. It calls the right function. It calls the overridden function, even if you're treating it as a base instance, okay? And we talked about this in, in virtual functions. So this was sort of a, a repeat. And basically what I'm saying is, even with abstract functions, you have this capability. And this is a very powerful capability. It's, it's great. It's what makes, in my opinion, is what makes inheritance and polymorphism amazing, is the fact that you can do this. This little thing, if you, if you know how to use this thing very well, power to you, because it's very great. So this will use the eat function implemented in Do. All right, any questions about abstract functions before we go to talk about something that still relates to abstract functions, but you gotta understand abstract functions before we go to the next, right? It's a virtual function that has no body and must be overridden by the children. All right, I will take your silence as a good thing. Let's go. All right, let's talk about interfaces. All right, so a class who only has abstract functions is called an interface. So if all the functions, so basically our animal class, our animal class is not an interface, right? Because it has a get age, it has a get weight, it has a constructor that takes parameters, which means that the animal object has to be created and you need parameters to create it. So it's not completely abstract, right? It's not entirely abstract because it has this. Uh, it's not abstract because you can get a, a age. It's not abstract because you can get a weight, right? So all these things, it also has a breathing function, right? So all those functions are not abstract. The only one is this one. So the animal class is not an interface. However, if I, let's say that I got rid of, you know, let me just comment that out. Let's say I just had my, my default constructor because we know those are always there. And let's just say that this one became virtual and uh, sorry, abstract, and this one became abstract and this one became abstract. Everything was abstract. All right, I'm not gonna do it because we're just gonna waste time on me uh, writing code. But imagine that everything looks like this one. This is equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero, and then these are virtual. This will be called an interface. And, and it's called an interface, not because you know C++ treats it any different. To C++ is the same thing. It's just a bunch of functions that must be overridden by the child and implement them, right? We call them an interface because they actually serve an interesting purpose. So the parent class, in this case, imagine that the parent class, just use imagination, imagine that the parent class uh, doesn't do anything. It just specifies things, right? So it tells you how, a children, how its children will behave, right? It says, my children, uh, we'll be able to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, whatever. Like, you can do all these things. They can do all these things. I don't know how they're going to do them though. You know, so imagine a parent who takes, I don't know, takes their kid to a daycare and it's like, my child will play, will eat and will sleep. How he will sleep, eat and eat, I don't know. He'll let you know once he's in there running around or, or, or whatever, right? So in this case, the interface is just a class that provides like a set of specifications is like, it's like my children will do these things, okay? I don't know how they will achieve them, but they will do these things, right? That's the purpose of an interface. That's it. It doesn't provide any logic because all of its functions are abstract and it just basically tells you how its children will behave. So when a class inherits from an interface, we often say that the, cl that the derived class is implementing the interface, right? So if animal class was a, an interface and dog inherits from animal, we will say the dog implements the animal class or the animal interface, right? It's just, again, it's just a terminology, right? But behind the scenes is the same stuff. For us humans, we, we think of this as a, as a special type of, of uh, idea, which is an interface, right? Okay, so an, interfi an, interfi an interface defines how a class should operate. Which class? It's derivations, it's children. All right, let's go over a quick example, just to, to see uh, if, if, if uh, this helps you understand what do I mean by an interface. Here's a PlayStation controller. If you're an Xbox guy, it's, you know, that's fine. Imagine an Xbox controller. 
right? So here's a PlayStation controller, and this controller has, you know, a bunch of buttons, right? It has the arrows, it has two thumbsticks, and then it has these four buttons on the right, and then it has triggers and these other things they've added uh, over the years, right? But let's just, just, just focus on the simple ones. Let's just focus on these four and the two thumbsticks and these four on the right. I, forget the rest for now. They're still part of it, but let's just ignore them, right? What I want you to understand is that when you hit this button, when you hit the X, what, what happens? It, it sends a command to your PlayStation, and the PlayStation interprets that command, right? X, okay, goes to the PlayStation. You're playing a video game. What does X do? Jumps. So then your character jumps, right? Now, what is interesting is that it's not the button that makes the character jump. The button is just the trigger, right? It triggers that action. But the button itself, there's no magic in the button that automatically makes this virtual character jump. The button is just a trigger. It triggers a bunch of stuff underneath the controller, a bunch of electronics that make this happen, okay? So if I was to, you know, remove the face of this controller, let's just say that, I, you know, I grab a knife on the side and I cut it and then I take off the top, right? To make it look something like this, right? So here is the... The, the all the electronics inside the controller and here is the face right so if i turn it around i couldn't find a good picture of, of it being around but if i turn this one around uh you would have the face right with these buttons in it and the, and the thumbsticks and these four arrows and this now if you try to use your playstation with only the face right not with this only the face you will realize that nothing happens right you would just hit the buttons and nothing happens and it makes sense because again the buttons are just triggers. They enable a command to go to the electronics. These electronics interpret that command, and then that command gets sent through this little wire, or let's say wireless, wirelessly, because this is, you know, the new ones are wireless. So it goes through some, you know, signal. It goes to the PlayStation. The PlayStation receives the signal. Then that signal gets interpreted. Then it goes to the video game that you're playing. Then the video game interprets that, and the video game says, ah, I'm supposed to jump, and then the thing jumps, all right? So something very tiny and simple, like pressing a button, trigger a bunch of stuff underneath. An interface, where we're talking about this abstract class with nothing but abstract functions, an interface is the face, right? And that's why it's called an interface, right? If you have a radio on your car, it has an interface. How you change the radio frequency, how you change the volume. You have a keyboard, you have an interface, the keys. You have a remote, you have an interface, the buttons you can push in the remote, etc. So the interface tells you how you are going to use the rest of the system or the rest of the other classes or the rest of the things that are going to be used, right? And so what's interesting about this is that you can separate the design of how something will be used and how something works, right? So the engineers, the electrical engineers, the, and maybe, just, yeah, and software engine and developers, those guys, and ladies, they work together to make this happen, to get all these electronics, to get the wireless connection, to get the PlayStation connect, all those things, you got the engineers working. And then you have another person or another group of people who are like user experience designers, you know, who they're like, you know, I'm all about the user having the best experience possible. And what they do is they work on the face, right? They're like, okay, we need a remote that it's this thick, that the buttons are this much separated from each other, that the thumbsticks feel like they're good and like you can actually, like they don't slip. And you need like all, oh, the, the, it has to have this curve on the right so that it, you can have a nice grip with it. Those group of people, they are working on the interface. And the engineers, they are working on how this system will be used. And then at the end, they put these two together, right? And basically when they put them together, you have a full working system. You guys, when you look at uh, interfaces and classes, is the same thing, except that instead of hardware, we're talking about software. So if, let's say, just to give you a, a much more realistic example, let's say that you're working on some software, and in that software, there is a, a someone is going to ask you to, to provide with some information on the screen, like tables of data, right? Let's, you gotta show a bunch of data on the screen. You show tables, you show graphs, you show all these things. You need to write a lot of code for that. You need some graphics. You need to be able to, to present the data in the in a right format with the on the on the graphs and the tables, right? And then you have another person 
who says, I'm going to work on the database, which means I am going to work on having a place where we can store the data, retrieve it, and modify it. You two work separately, right? And then your boss comes and says, hey, man, I have like 10 people working on different databases. I don't know which one we're going to use for your project. Maybe we use all 10. Who knows? We don't know yet. But just know that you might work with all 10 of them. And you're like, man, am I supposed to write code to work with every single one of them? So instead, what you say, you know what? I'm going to define an interface. And I'm going to say, my software will interact with other classes as long as they provide these functionalities, right? So you provide an interface to the 10 other database people. And you say, hey, your database will be compatible with my code so long as your database code has these functions in it. Well, that's an interface. You're saying, you got to have these functionalities, and they have to look like this. Once you have them, I, I will be able to use your software without a problem. I don't have to modify anything. You can have a database in Java or whatever, you know, SQL or a database in MongoDB or whatever all these other databases there is. As long as you provide the, the functionalities with this interface, we are good. I can use any of the databases. And one day you can swap from one to the other. So the whole point of an interface, the you know, I talked for like six minutes. It's, it's something quite simple. You just want to provide to other people who are working with you, who are going to make some of their classes, who you don't know how their classes are going to work. You just want to provide with, hey, I can use any class that you make so long as it has these functions. And I would use those functions according to, you know, this specification or, you know, this is how I think they should work. You know, like the eating function, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, the, all, all the face of the, of the controller was the interface. And so you can say, look, like the animal class, right? I gave you an example of the animal class and we had 10 animals, right? But let's just say that, you know, this is a video game and I want to provide with mods. You know, you, you, maybe you've heard of the mods that you can install mods into a video game, right? So maybe you say, you know what? I don't know. Uh, what kind of mods you might come in. You, I don't know what kind of mods you might create. Uh, I only have these 10 animals. Maybe you want to add more animals to the video game. So I'm going to provide you with an interface. If you want to add an 11th animal, uh, you just have to provide with an eating function. You have to provide with some animations as to how it walks, how it jumps, how it makes noise, for example. And then once you provide those, the game, the, the new animal that you have created will work entirely, right? So this is a way for you to, to provide functionality that you don't know it exists yet. It makes code very modular, yes. And in fact, you can make interfaces to connect different modules that were created independent of each other. You can put an interface in between them and try and connect them. Well, there, there's a whole uh, concept of design patterns. We'll talk about a few at the end of the course. However, it's just, it's just that, right? In, in simple terms, you're just defining how some classes should behave. And you can use that to your advantage because then you say, well, I don't know the specifics, but I know what they're going to do. Therefore, I can use them before I even know they exist. That's the beauty. I don't know how the other animals that you might create exist, but I can use them if I want to, right? It's very similar to our assignment six. I don't know what shapes you guys were making. Well, I knew because I gave you the assignment. However, I'm like, I don't know how you're going to code them. I don't know how you're going to implement the getting perimeter and area. All I know is that you use the functions that I have provided and it's going to work. And you and I can make that assignment better if I had made the shape and interface, right? However, we didn't know about interfaces back then. So I just made it into a thing you inherit from and whatever. Maybe that's a good assignment seven. Who knows? But well, we'll see. All right. So that is what an interface is. So let's go back to inheritance tips. We talked about t three types of inheritance or three places where if you do inheritance, this is a good thing. The first one is you can think of the base class as a generic version of the derived class, right? The second one was you can think of the base class, uh, sorry, you can think of the derived class as an extension of the base class. And the third one, you can think of the base class as a foundation, right? So the derived class is built on top of the foundation. Now here's the fourth one. You can think of the base class as an interface that the derived classes must adhere to or that they must implement. A good short, uh, a good short summary for interfaces. Uh, 
Well, I would say, let's see. Let's let's uh, look up what interface means in Google. Interface. This is not Google. Okay, well, here. Is it. So an interface, a device or program enabling a user to communicate with a computer, right? Or or a point where two systems, subjects, organizations meet and interact. So these are not bad ways to summarize what an interface. And the reason I say that is because there's a reason why they picked that name, right? So an interface is how you operate something. You might have some huge machinery that is super, like, think of your car. Like your car is a, is a complex machine, right? But you control it with a steering wheel and some pedals. You control this, we, you know, this complex machine with engine and wires and all these other things. And the only thing you need to use is a steering wheel and two pedals or three if you're in manual and the plus the, the stick. But let's just say you're in auto. You, you only have a steering wheel and two pedals and that's it. So it's like the, 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 joy, the, the joystick, the, the steering wheel and the two pedals, they are your interface to the car. It's how you use the car. So an interface is it's the specification of how something should, how something will be used. Right. And, and you can have someone who designs steering wheels who says, look, I make steering wheels. They work for any car. I don't know what car you're making, but it's going to work for your car. And then they buy them and they use them. Right. So this is this is an example. I'm just making interfaces. I'm making I am creating the thing that you are going to use to work with your system. And it doesn't do anything. The steering wheel alone doesn't move a car. It's the fact that it's hooked to the car. And, and then it controls everything, right? Same thing with the face of the controller. The face doesn't do anything but trigger the events that actually do the things, right? I'm not saying they're not important. Of course they're important, right? That's, this is how we, we do everything. Everything that you work with has an interface. Even, even, uh, even PowerPoint, look at PowerPoint. Let me, let, me, let me, PowerPoint, this is the interface, right? When you click home, when I click this insert button, what happens is the, uh, the my click is nothing. It's just a trigger. But behind the scenes, there's a bunch of software saying, hey, change all these options up here and do this and do that, right? So the interface is always the thing that you provide as to this is how it will be used, okay? Programmatically speaking, an interface is just a class whose functions are all abstract. Well, there you have it, the lecture on abstract members, classes, and interfaces. If you enjoy this video and you don't mind, if you learn something new and you don't mind, leave a like. If you're new to this channel, check out the channel. Maybe you like what you see. I plan to post more of the lectures that I gave, but maybe by the time you're watching this, I have already posted them. If not, I promise you I will post them slowly as I can and as, I, as we go forward. All right. But if you, if you like anything else you see on the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below. And as always, be safe, take care, and peace out.